like Kenton said, we are in this series called Mental Matters that we've been in the last few weeks where we've been looking at mental health, mental illness, um, because we think this is a really important topic for us to be talking about, especially because the church has had uh, this stigma so often that like, if there's something you're struggling with, if you just pray more, if you just read your Bible more, your, your faith isn't strong enough, it will just fix these things. And don't get me wrong, I fully believe in all those things, and those things are really powerful, and those are practices that we should practice. But often, they aren't the solution to mental illness. Instead, we've been um, kind of using this phrase throughout this series that mental illness is a signal, not a sin. And that oftentimes mental illness says more about your chemistry in your body than your Christianity. And we think that this is something that we should bring and be able to talk about in church because we believe that if, if there's something that we should uh, want to talk about, if there's something that maybe is we'll have some hard conversations about, we should be talking about that in church, that this of all places on the planet is a place where it's okay to not be okay, It'd be a place where we can be authentic, we can be real, and this is hopefully a safe haven for anybody no matter what they are going through, whether they feel like they have a grasp on it or maybe they don't. We want to be able to be that place. And so um, in this series, the first week we talked about anxiety. Last week we talked about depression. And this week uh, I get to talk about trauma. Um, and so I know all of us are coming at this from so many different places. Um, so before we kind of get into it, let me just pray for us because um, it's just the heaviness of the subject. Father, thank you so much. Uh, for this day. And I just pray that um, as we share this morning, as we show the interview here in a little bit, um, that you would just show up in big ways to help people maybe start taking next steps in their, uh, the trauma. They would start to become more aware of how this trauma is affecting them. And I pray you would just speak truth over so many people today. Thank you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so as we're talking about trauma, at least for me, it's always good to kind of have like a baseline definition so we're all on the same page. Uh, so go ahead, throw that up there. So trauma is the lasting emotional response that often results from living through a distressing event. And this can be, can be physical, can be mental, can be emotional, it can be spiritual. And um, as a side note, like if yours is like a spiritual trauma, Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for whether you're in the room, maybe you're watching online. Um, thank you. Because whether it was maybe like a group of people that maybe something happened and something changed and you kind of maybe felt forced out of like a previous church or a, ch a church experience or church group, or maybe you had a pastor who maybe lied to you or manipulated you in some way, um, thank you for trusting again. Thank you for listening. Um, your faith might be bigger than mine because I have not ever had those kinds of experiences. So thank you for trusting us. Um, but we want to talk about this because so often with trauma, at least for me growing up, whenever things got really hard, I was always told like just this phrase of like, all right, get over it, like rub some dirt in it, right? And then keep on going. Um, and trauma is one of those things that you can't just kind of bottle up you can't just kind of push to the side and just kind of ignore and act like, oh, I'm just going to walk around this. No, like you can't just get past trauma. You have to heal from it by going through it. And so as we're kind of uh, talking about this morning, there's three types of trauma that, you know, some of us have experienced. The first one is acute this is like a one-time event thing that happens in your life. Maybe it's like a car wreck. Maybe this is like a natural disaster. Maybe this is rape. Maybe this is like a different kind of bad experience that you had in the past. It is like a one-time event that you're still dealing with. Then there's chronic, um, which is long-term, prolonged, repeated events that happen. Maybe for you, this is you were like bullied when you were younger over and over and over. Maybe this is racism, and it's something that you've been dealing with your entire life. Maybe this is for you losing a loved one and still having to deal with those repercussions and the feeling of loss. Uh, for some of you, maybe this is abuse from uh, maybe someone that you have uh, been with or like uh, had in your family had uh, abused drugs or alcohol. Maybe they verbally abused you, sexually abused you, emotionally abused you, whatever that looks like. They abused you in some way. Or maybe uh, the third kind for us, uh, the types of trauma is complex. 
Um, this is like multiple ongoing traumatic events, like more than one at the same time. Oftentimes, this is like family with someone abusing in like different ways, different scenarios. There's a lots of different ways that this can show up in our lives. And the reason this is so important for us to talk about and to deal with is so often with these traumatic things that happen to us, there's these wounds that you can't see, but they hurt just as much as the wounds that you can see, if not even more. And oftentimes they take even longer to recover from, from than the wounds that you actually can see, right? And so this is why trauma matters. This is why it matters what we do with it, because trauma changes us right? It changes the way that you look at yourself. It changes the way that you look at other people. It changes the way that you uh, look at God. It even changes like your outlook on life. And so we have to be able to talk about this and be able to deal with this. And so what I want to share today is part of um, the story of Paul. Um, if you've grown up in church, I'm sure you have heard about this guy. Um, he was basically, um, his ministry started actually going against people who follow Jesus. He was trying to put them in prison, trying to kill them. And then he has this moment, he starts following Jesus. Jesus shows up to him and it completely changes his life. Ends up going around all over the ancient world, starting new churches, spreading the news of Jesus. Um, and most historians actually would say that for like the spreading of Christianity, like Paul actually did more work and did more for like the spreading of where uh, Christianity is today than Jesus even did. Right, because like Jesus, kind of, it was still kind of just his his little crew, but Paul is one that took it out into the world. So he has this huge impact on Christianity, this faith that we have today, and he still has plenty of moments that were not great. So he has this, um, at one of the churches he planted is in the city of Corinth, and he writes him this letter. And in this letter, there's this giant passage where he just starts going through some of the things that he's dealt with. I want to kind of just go through it real quick. Go ahead, throw up that first part. It says, are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. It says, I am more. I have worked much harder. I've been in prison more fre frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. And um, I think sometimes when we hear this, like when I think of prison, oftentimes I think of like, you know, what we think of today, like, you know, they got a little TV. Um, you get like, you're kind of in a cell most of the day, but like you got a bed and like you get like your little recess time. Um, and to be honest, like you get three meals a day, like, you don't have to make any decisions. Sometimes that sounds like a vacation to me, right? Like, depending on, like, the busyness of my life, like, that doesn't sound too bad. That is not the prison that Paul is dealing with, right? Like, he is chained. He is in, like, these miserable rooms. Um, there's for sure just a bucket in the corner that they probably don't change that often, and you know what the bucket's for. Um, he's probably sharing that with another person. The chains would have been, like, ripping up his hands, kind of been cutting, you know, all kinds of infections going on. Like, this is not the kind of prison that we generally think Think about. He talks about being flogged, which is basically like being beaten, being exposed to death again and again. Like for so many of us, like this would be enough. But then he continues. He says, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one, which is him basically in the Jewish law, there was this rule that you could only give someone up to 40, uh, like whip them 40 times. And so because they wanted to be rule followers, they didn't want to accidentally go over that 40 limit. So they would just do 39. So just in case they miscounted, you wouldn't actually get the full 40. Um, so that's what he's talking about. They, they gave him 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones, three times I was shipwrecked, and I spent a night and a day in the open sea. Again, not, not getting better, right? Not getting better for this guy. Let's continue. He says, I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, which is basically anyone who wasn't a Jew, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. Guys, this guy's got a lot of danger in his life, right? Like everything that is around him feels like it's all going against him. There is so much going against Paul in this moment. And he wraps up this passage. This is what he says. He says, I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. 
I've been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Again, he was kind of spending his life going from city to city, starting all these churches, this church planner. And he had all the stress of like making sure everyone kind of figured out what they were doing, making sure everyone was like, you know, doing the right things. And I don't know about you guys, but if you gave me even one of the things on this list, almost any one of them by themselves would have been enough to give me trauma for the rest of my life, right? But he just has this giant list of things. And maybe, I don't know, sometimes I think when we think of people in the Bible, we think, oh yeah, but they just, like these miserable things happened to them and they were just really glad about it, right? Or they just never lost faith. They were always full of hope. Um, But actually earlier in the letter to the city of Corinth, this is what he says. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we are experiencing in the province of Asia. We are under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. So we despaired of life itself. If you don't know, despair means like hopeless, right? Like he literally is saying like our life felt hopeless. This guy that is known for spreading the word of Jesus and saying like, this is my hope is saying like, no, all these things, all these traumatic events I'm going through, I feel hopeless right now. But despite being the guy who went through all these things, still writes passages that people quote to this day through our Bible. Things like Romans 15, 13. May the Lord of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Or things like Philippians 4, 4 through 5. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. So how does he do that? How does he go from a place where he should be so broken to being someone who helps spread the gospel, spread the mission of Jesus, and still can say things like this despite all the brokenness in his life? Well, I want to switch over to our interview that we're going to be sharing. Like Kenton said, we've been doing an interview every week of this series. The last two weeks they've been live because of like some scheduling conflicts. This one is going to be a video. This is Joel interviewing um, a marriage and family therapist in our uh, community named Creation Desitel. Um, it's incredible. To be honest, like the interview is like 45 minutes long and we had to cut it down to like 20 minutes because we'd be here all morning. Um, and I'm trying to talk Joel into like putting out like a director's cut because there's so much good that we kind of had to cut out of this. So check this out. Well, hey, today we have the privilege of having a conversation with Creation Desitel, who is a therapist in our community. And um, I'm just so excited to get to sh- chat a little bit about um, mental health and spirituality and how we can grow together. So Creation, that's a cool name. Can we just start there? Like, I've never met anybody named Creation before. I'm sure that everybody is used to that, right? Yeah. I actually think I have the only, the, I think I'm the only person with that name in the English language. Because, like, six degrees of Kevin Bacon, I'm, yeah. like, in my mid-40s, and I've never met anybody that's <laughs> met anybody. So I'm kind of thinking, like, no, it's, it's, it's just me. I think the closest corollary is... In Spanish, conception is a name. I think that is the closest I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think, I think it's it's you. I think it's me. Yeah, Yeah, I I wear that. I wear that mantle. Apparently, (laughs) I'm like, all right. So tell tell us a little bit about your journey into being a mental health professional and how your faith in Jesus sort of intersects inside of that story. Okay, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna break it down. I actually think um, my journey to being a mental health provider started in early childhood. Um, I had, um, uh, I came from a broken home. Um, I was raised by a single mom and my childhood encompassed a fair amount of broad experiences of of trauma and abuse. Um, There was was physical violence in my home as a small child. Um, There was physical violence in my broader Um, family structure and we lived with um, extended family so I saw a lot of physical violence I saw a lot of just brokenness in my home Um, I had um, I have a 
I have a history of childhood sexual trauma, so I had a lot of that very, very early on. But what's interesting is even as a child, I had this very profound sense that I wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where that, like, I didn't cultivate that, I didn't go looking for that, but I never felt invisible, mm -hmm. even in those events. And I remember, even as a very small child, I remember praying and just having this sense that, like, I mean, I couldn't have, like, chapter and verse or propositionally <laughs> stated, like, the plan of salvation, but, like, I had a sense that, like, when I voiced those, this can't be right, this shouldn't be happening, that, like, somebody heard that. Like, and mm -hmm. I, you know, all I can say is, like, that was just a gift I, I had from, from early childhood on. It's kind of from the journey of your trauma, your wounds, yeah. it, it's, it's not wasted. And you see, you no. see how God can you know, draw straight with broken crayons and crooked lines. And mm -hmm. now the healing that you get to help provide for people, empowered by God and your schooling and stuff, it's, it's brought meaning to some of those things, which is really powerful. Yeah, That's for awesome. me it's been, it, it has been healing. And it really, like, I, I absolutely embrace that sort of wounded healer ethos. Um, and I try and be really transparent with my, with my clients. I try and be like, look, man, my life isn't perfect. And it wasn't perfect. Um, I'm here to share the journey. I'm not here, like, dispensing wisdom from yeah. on high. And I really feel like a lot of my wisdom was forged in and through the arc of my from childhood to now. And I, I have that sense of like, I mean, Joseph, when he's like, what you meant for ill, God purposed for good. I like, I really You're living feel, that. like I feel ownership in that. And, I, and that really resonates. It's like, I don't think that everybody in my path was a good actor. But when I look at the way the threads have been woven together, I don't think any of it's been wasted. So let's uh, talk a little bit deeper into just this whole conversation about trauma. Trauma has become kind of a buzzword <laughs> in uh, just on social media mm -hmm. and uh, you know TikTok and all those different kind sure. of things. Um, but from your understanding clinically and your experience, like how do you define what trauma is compared to just like having a hard time? We see trauma happening often when sins imprint on us when there okay, is so something happens something to happens us. to me there's an external something or series of something that aggregates into this well past what any human soul could reasonably mm. bear right and there is a subjective some people are more resilient than others but like today when it's like i was in the grocery store and this was like so traumatic and i'm like <laughs> What you mean is mildly annoy annoying or like wildly socially in inappropriate, which is fair, but that, but it's, it's, it's not trauma, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so sometimes it's something that happens to us. Yes. And then how else could trauma show up? The other way we see it often is like, and this is something that like is really hard in a modern context to talk about. In particular, mental health, there's very much a secular humanist tradition wherein like there's this idea that... Um, if we put a human person in optimal conditions, they will see They'll growth. Be good they will see growth, growth yeah. and yeah. flourishing and optimization. And I think this is where like my faith holds that intention. And here's what I mean. Like the anthropology of what it means to be a human person is if you're a Christian, it's like we are we are all image bearers of the divine. And we cannot so deeply mar that as to fully negate our humanity. Mm. And when you see that, when you see the best of the human spirit, this is, this is that thumbprint of, of, of the divine on us. Mm -hmm. And so, but I also hold that intention Brokenness with, as well. like, mm -hmm. go back to the Garden of Eden, the fall of man. We have both inherent and indwelling sin as well as the brokenness of the world around us. And sometimes realizing our own internal can be incredibly traumatic. Um, and often it's not an either or, it's a both and. Mm. I experience profound violence and then one day I have a hard day and I realize that that violence is welling up inside of me. And that is also a trauma, this like, 
I'm looking in the mirror and I don't like what I see. Yeah. I don't like what pulls forth out of my, my inward space. That can also be a source of tremendous trauma. So things that are done to us and things that rise within us. And I think that you see that in scripture. There's both the fallenness and brokenness of the world and then there's this indwelling brokenness within each of us. Mm -hmm. And both of those can be deeply, deeply traumatic for us. But it's interesting because while we're making little things trauma things and like we're overblowing it, we also on the other end, we minimize. I don't know if you know this, but like one in four women between birth and death will experience some form of sexual trauma. Look around. One in, four. one in four. And like if you look at men, it's less, but it's still like one in eight. Mm -hmm. Which like it's if you're still... in a congregation of 500, like yeah, of you people. actually are probably very likely in relationship with somebody that has had some form of physical, verbal, emotional, psychological, or sexual trauma. And then that says nothing of, you know, 2% of our population has been in the military, and there's a fixed percentage of those that have seen things that are, that are unspeakable to see. Yeah. And so it's not as rare as we think it is, but don't cheapen it, right? Just because it's ugly and gray doesn't make it trauma. We don't need to minimize it. We just don't need to label it trauma. Yeah. Be like, that's just gray and terrible, yeah. right? but there's actually more trauma than we think there is. But like, let's really make those meaningful distinctions. And the reality is they both need to be spoken to. They just have differing degrees of difficulty and investment and maybe some needs more like legitimate clinical care. But I think a lot of it, just good solid community would get us 90% of the way there, right? Farther down the field. Yeah, yeah, like I'd have a way lighter case roster if there was more of that. I know we have to paint with a broad brush, but in talking to people that have experienced trauma, what are some of the steps forward or um, places of hope that they can walk to start processing? I mean, I think part of the problem that I just see in our like culture is that we don't wanna deal with things. We don't wanna look back. We wanna put newspaper on top of it and act like nothing happened here. Um, but what are ways that we can move towards health and deal with what we've experienced so that we can move forward and thrive? Okay, well, it's interesting. When we, in mental health, we look at trauma, um, we can talk about like PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, right? But what we talk about less in common vernacular is post-traumatic growth. So oh, I think, wow. and, and that's a real and documented phenomenon. And, and we don't talk about it much, but like, um, like, a, like my poster child for that is like Corrie Ten Boom, right? So Corrie Ten Boom was um, a woman who was in the Nazi concentration camps. And like her and her sister, like in her autobiography, she talks about like they would always pray together. And uh, like, I, I love this, Corrie Ten Boom was praying and she prayed and thanked God for the lice. And her sister was like, why would you do that? And she said, I don't know, but we have this, it must be for a reason. And then come to find out after, in the aftermath of the war when they were interviewing um, the guards in the concentration camps, the women that were not assaulted and abused were the women that had, had, lice. Lice. had lice. And so Corey Ten Boom had post-traumatic growth. She came out from being in the concentration camp, camps with this profound message of forgiveness. And she actually went and toured and talked with like guards and told guards like, I forgive, forgive them, I forgive face. you, yeah. I forgive you. So this is post-trauma growth. And we actually, it's weird because mental health is largely problem focused. So everybody has this idea of like post-traumatic stress. But I think before we can even like ask what do we do, we have to acknowledge that there's not only one pathway. It's not always post-traumatic stress and disordered. Acknowledge that it can be something different and just things be can, okay. Yeah, yeah, things can be better. Post-traumatic growth, post-trauma flourishing is real. It's, it's so hopeful to hear. Yeah, yeah. like and but but like if you don't even believe that that's possible, you might not even be looking for mm. it. You might not be open to it. So I would say that if you think you've experienced trauma or even if you don't think you've experienced trauma, if you think you just experienced like gray ugly not great. <laughs> right? Which isn't trauma, but it's yeah. not, you know, like it's not flourishing acknowledge that like there is this stress and we can really take that path, but we can also do the things that we know how to do uh, to move towards post-trauma post growth. And I actually think one of those keys is, is really illuminated by the story I just told, which is like having, having a willingness or an openness to be grateful.
Wow. Right? Like, can I just be like grateful? Like a defiant gratefulness, right? Like yeah, in like, the face I'm gonna of whatever, show, yeah, yeah, like, I'm going to be grateful I'm a, for like, I'm going to be grateful for the lice. Wow. I'm going to be grateful. And in modern life, where we're so used to having systems in place such that, like, literally, I mean, think about our world today in so many ways. You can get what you want your oh, way right. right away on your terms. Mm -hmm. And, like, comparatively, at a, at, a, at a reasonable price point, right? Like, it used to be, like, mass customization was, like, for, Impossible. like, the elite. Yeah. But now it's just, like, fairly prevalent. But if you have this idea that when I don't get what I want, when my bases don't get covered, that maybe that's not plan B. Maybe, like my story, like Corey's story, maybe there is this story of post-trauma growth to be had. I think when we look at healing from trauma, um, I remember sitting in school and hearing a professor say, with very few exceptions, like tsunamis and natural disasters, but for the vast majority of the human race, um, your trauma is going to be seated and executed in relationship. Wow. My dad's gonna hurt me, my mom's gonna hurt me, my older brother, my cousin, my sister, the bully at school, a person. So most trauma is relationally rooted. And the insight uniquely of say marriage and family therapy as opposed to clinical mental health, we take this systemic approach. And so the insight that I bring to the table is trauma is by and large rooted relationally and healing also is rooted relationally. So wow. when you ask the question of how do, how do we heal from trauma, one of my best answers, and it's not a quick fix, it's not a panacea, and honestly, a lot of my clients don't like it. They want, they're like, you're the professional, can't you just, and I'm like, actually, one of the best things I can do is tell you to go out and forge meaningful, deep, robust community, because, what we do when we forge healthy relationships is we engage in what's called the corrective experience, right? So if I have this experience that men treat women a particular way, and then I go out and I contrast that and I'm like, wow, I got really juked and I experienced that as trauma. I can do one of two things, right? I can either decide like, oh, this is just the way Men are. All men, men are, mm -hmm. and like, it's an outlier. The goodness I see out here is an outlier. I can be dismissive of that and be like, this is really what's true, right? And then my job is just kind of manage and navigate that. But the other thing I can do is I can look at that, that thing that's so different than, than what I have done, and I can lean into relationship with that. I can attach myself to the people doing relationship in ways that feel different, that feel whole dignified, healthy, reasonable, comprehensible, mm -hmm. right? Like, and that corrects in this odd way. It's like, if I've been, if I've got this narrative that men dominate women or men treat women badly or the very apparent opposite, women like henpeck and dominate and manipulate and abuse men and men are just like, you know, sort of that Homer Simpson, they're like, <laughs> just duh, 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 right? Like if I have this narrative and then I see something else, I can dismiss it as an outlier or I can be like, those people have a thing that I, I want to know. Have, yeah. I want to know about that. I want to do relationship with those people. Mm -hmm. And often I think we're really embarrassed and ashamed to go ask people doing a thing differently than we're doing. Like, hey, how does that work for you? Because I've not experienced that. Man, I don't have the I, tools to see it. Yeah, yeah. I want that. That sounds mm -hmm. like I want to feel that way in my relationship towards men or my relationship towards women. Mm -hmm. I want to feel that way about what's possible. So find relationship, meaningful, deep, juicy, hard fought relationality is the corrective experience to abuse and trauma in yeah. so many ways. Okay, so we have a lot of people today listening or listening online later that maybe they've experienced something traumatic in their life. Um, and so maybe this has helped them figure out their next step towards moving towards wholeness. But I assume we have most people that are like, yeah, that hasn't been my experience or not in that same way but they know people, they love people, they're in yeah. relationship with people that have experienced trauma. What practical advice would you give the friend, the parent, the coworker who loves somebody who's struggled or is walking around with this extra baggage of right. trauma on their life that's not cheap, 
<laughs> it, but, but it's deeply meaningful. So I think there are a couple things. I think, first of all, is like you use this word of cheapening, and I actually think one of the things we do in modern church life a lot is we are like toxically positive, and it's just like, yeah. you know, God's good and Jesus is great. And so when somebody shares with you the heavy, often it can be like, oh, I'm praying for you and God's faithful. And like, yeah. it's gonna, right? So one of the ways we actually cheapen it is when somebody says the heavy thing, what if we just sat with the heavy thing mm. with them? What if when somebody says like, I have done or the unspeakable was done to me, instead of immediately rushing to like, Here's the memory verse. Yeah, Here's like, the, yeah, yeah. yeah, to like fix or immediately redeem or find that silver lining. One of the things that I would say is the most valuable to somebody who is experiencing something traumatic or has and is now reckoning with that is to acknowledge and honor mm. that it is what it is and like hold space for that. And I think that's actually really counterintuitive to everybody, but in particular, I think it's counterintuitive to the Christian sometimes because we have this message of hope. And I think, like, I'm not negating the big ticket, final analysis, eschatological hope, but like, have you read Ecclesiastes or Lamentations or parts of Proverbs? Lots of space for there, lament and sadness and grief. Yeah, and there is this, there is, the scripture has this. It talks about mourning with those who mourn and grieving with those who grieve. And I would say, be traumatized with those who have had trauma. Wow. Like, let yourself take in, like, I can't imagine what it would yeah. be like to have that done to me, or I can't imagine what it's like to wake up and have that rise within me. I I don't know. I but but I. Wow, I believe you when you tell me this is what that feels like. That's such a powerful sentence to speak back. Not that I know exactly what it's like. Not that well, you know, God's good. God works all things. But to be like, I believe you that your experience made you feel the way that it is and it's awful this is terrible and i'm gonna let you be right where you, where you are as opposed to like needing to put a pretty face or needing to put happier brighter language yeah no it's hard and it's heavy and you don't know what to do and maybe i'm gonna be the one person that tells you it's okay for you to not be okay today. What if one of the things that, that, that leads to enduring and persistent positivity is honoring and allowing and making peace and sitting with the not positive, the heavy, the gray, the, the, the mean, the cruel, the sad, the unspeakable. What if enduring positivity is born out of a deep reckoning rather than a glossing over or denial? of that. And so I would say if you're with somebody that has trauma, make space for that. Make just be a safe person to let them, don't fix them, don't manage them, don't try and resolve it. Just be present and acknowledge like, yeah, that's how you feel mm -hmm. and it's okay for you to feel that way right now. Creation, thank you so much for this conversation today. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for the good work that you're doing in our community. Um, thanks for the way that you partner with God in your vocation. Um, we're just really grateful for your voice and for your expertise. And um, thanks again. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. So I want to kind of close this out and go back to a verse that Paul said, and this is after he gets done talking through all these different things that he had gone through. And he says this near the end of the letter. He says, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And when I read this, and if you just take it at face value, this sounds crazy, right? You're like, no, when you're weak, you're just weak, right? But there is something that Paul knows that is happening that makes it so that when he is weak, he can be strong. Uh, it reminds me of this story that I heard in the last few weeks about this guy named Keith Jarrett. You might know, uh, I've heard of him before. Uh, he's a legendary jazz piano player. 
Um, and this story takes back, place back in 1975, Cologne, Germany. Um, and he was in the area doing some shows. And then during this time, there was this girl who reached out to him. She was only 17 at the time. Her name was Vera Brandes. And she reached out and said, hey, I would love for you to come to Cologne and like do a concert here, do a show. We would love to have that. And for whatever reason, he agrees. They talk about like when he showed up, like he was, he was like uh, his, having all kinds of like jet lag. He had like some weird back pains. Like he was not in a a great place. And when he got there, there had been a miscommunication about the piano that they had brought out for him. He didn't even get him like a full grand piano. So like the piano they gave him was too small for the room that he was going to be performing in. And it was actually like the normally like the rehearsal piano that they used for like the opera that had also taken place there. So like all of the keys were like, it wasn't tuned well. The sustain pedals, like all the pedals were all messed up and sticking. And like it was just not a good piano. And so during rehearsal, he realizes this real quick and says, I'm not going to play on that. He was known for being a perfectionist, right? He says, I, you know, this wasn't like he was just starting his career. Like he is already like, you know, this is his career. He is a professional. He is not going to use this piano. And between uh, the rehearsal and the actual performance, they're not exactly sure what happened, how Vera uh, convinced him to go on, but she convinces them to go on anyways. Like they tried to fix up the, the piano as much as they could in between, but he goes out and just starts playing this concert with this broken instrument, this broken piano that no one even wanted to use. And what's crazy is that the people who are at that show, when they talk about it afterwards, they talked about it being like this amazing show. They were talking about like it almost felt magical. Like from the very beginning, they were like, oh, there is something different happening here. To the point where a lot of his fans talk about this being like the greatest moment of his entire career. They thankfully were recording it, and there's a little bit of a debate for why they were recording it. Some people were said that they just recorded it because of who he was. They always recorded every performance. Some people say no, like they were recording it because they wanted to kind of show, show everyone else, like, hey, if you don't give Keith the right stuff, like this is like what's going to happen. This is going to be the, what the performance sounds like, right? But instead, it ends up actually getting released as an album and becomes the greatest selling piano album of all time. Like this thing that should have been a complete train wreck becomes like the pinnacle, the highest moment of his entire career. And I tell you that story because I think like Paul, there's something about Keith. There's this truth that even a broken instrument can be used in the hands of a maker. And I think that is true for all of us. That even in our brokenness, when you work through your trauma, you don't just have to stay broken. You can be better on the other side of it. Like your trauma, your brokenness doesn't have to be the end of your story. Whether it is something that you did, whether it's something that maybe someone did to you, God never wastes a hurt. This doesn't have to be the end of your story. And just like creation talked about in the interview, and one of the best ways to deal with that is to deal with it in community. And we hope here at Bridgeway, we have tried so hard to make sure like it is so clear every single week, like this isn't just a show. This isn't just like, hey, I get to show up and like, you know, sit around for an hour. They play some music and someone goes up here and talks and hopefully connects with me or whatever. But like, this is a community of people. That's why we have table groups. And if you're not a part of one, please make it a priority. I know I've said this before, but like I have, um, and I've, I'll admit this from the stage, every table group and every small group I've ever been a part of, I literally dread going to it every single time time. But on the other side, I'm always so glad that I went because there is something that happens when you just get to be honest and authentic and share your life with other people. This is how we can continue to heal and move forward. We also have, um, we've been talking about all through this series, this mental, matter, mental matters ministry that's coming up. You can scan the QR code. You can put in that uh, URL. Um, but that, if you do that, it's going to give you a list of just vetted mental health professionals in our area, in our community. And we even have a few volunteers who have taken some extra training to kind of help, kind of be like first responders. So as you're waiting to kind of help you, talk you through some certain things. Um, but we want this to be a resource, not just for us, but for our community. So if there's other people you know that need this, please share it with them. Guys, we are all broken, but... That doesn't have to be the end of your story. We can be better on the other side.